Hey, Tested, Adam Savage here, standing next to Tested contributor and friend of Tested and model maker extraordinaire, Kate Sabaker. Kate has been working on this piece uh, for me, with me, uh, in the shop for several months. And we've been dying to tell you about it, but first, like, just a little bit about how much labor went into this thing. Uh, quite, quite a bit of labor. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little too much labor. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think we'd, let's do this reveal in a couple of pieces. Here, step aside. Um, we replicated the blimp from Blade Runner. Uh, this is Muff Eaton, Jason Eaton's kit. Uh, Jason's a friend and I bought this from him. Um, and then we did, you did such a gargantuan amount of labor Yeah, on this. We, we kind of went above and beyond <laughs> on uh, what was originally the idea and it just went kind of crazy. It is a magnificent piece. So let me plug it in. This is all about the light show. Here we go. Oink. Here it comes. Yeah. Notice the fiber optics have color changing. That's done with a color wheel built inside this thing like the original. These video files are the original video files from the film along with the audio. Uh, the spotlights actually animate. Those are servo driven 3D printed spotlight cages. I found lenses and machined tiny little hoods for them. Uh, I did a bunch of Photoshop on this, but Kate really did the 95% of the labor inherent in this. I'm gonna turn off that sound. There we go. Hold on. Let's turn this one off too. That's it. Notice that you stopped hearing this sound. That's because that sound is built into one of the monitors. They autoplay. So this one plays all the sounds of the commercials with the creepy lady smoking, and the other one repeatedly plays the off-world colony video. Um, and then uh, this weekend, actually, I put it in a, a stand made of a huge 30-pound hunk of steel on top of a slip ring so that you can spin it 360 degrees and it stays powered. Those are the broad strokes, but <laughs> Kate, you want to walk us through some of the specifics? Yeah, so what we got from uh, Jason was essentially this uh, vacuform shell. It came with some sheets of brass photo etch that um, were cut and turned into the antenna. And to be clear, the, the photo etch patterns that Jason had were incredibly accurate to the original. I'm oh, not sure yes. if he had the original photo files. Uh, oh, also we should explain. This is one half the size of the one they built for the film. This, you would call that one half studio scale. The one for the movie is four feet long and you can see it at Warner Brothers. Yes. You can still see it in one of their lobbies. Um, but this is a more manageable size. Yes, uh, and so we had the, the brass photo etch, and I actually saw photos from the original build, and you could see these giant brass photo etch pieces hanging behind them, and it looks exactly the same. Ours is just half the size. I will point out that there are 24 antennae uh, surrounding the perimeter of the blimp, and we made separate files in the computer of picture reference for every single one, so that each piece of torn, twisted brass on each one of these it's totally accurate. <laughs> yes, because those, those photo etch sheets that we got were just general pieces, and I had to say, okay, well, this component from this piece, this component from this piece, solder them all together and say, all right, this is the A antenna. And we lettered them, and we also had separate uh, uh, bins. We yes. had little foam core bins, yes. one for each antenna to store the original stock. The stocks were all different lengths. Their mounting points had to be engineered. They had these tiny, ridiculously small lights out at the end. Um, there are, do you, did you count how many advertising labels you put on? I did not count. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got a little lost in it, uh, but actually that was by far my favorite part. Really? Yes, definitely. Um, we did, uh, we drifted from Canon a little bit. 
because we put in a Savage Industry sticker, and I also asked Kay to put in a Sabaker Company sticker Aww. because you have to sign your work. I guarantee you every model of this complexity has exactly that. The Space Shuttle from Space Cowboys, my name is visible on one of the little parts in there, and so are several other crew members. Well, and in the original, we had some very high-res photos that I was studying, and in the original, you can see in tiny handwriting it says, uh, Ridley is God. So <laughs> that had its signature on it, so we had to put something on this Absolutely, one. they had Cinefex magazine? Yeah, Cinefex heavy metal, yeah. I like that, some Tamiya logos. Um, and all of this, uh, so there's a huge amount of mechanical and uh, electronic wiring inside the cap of this. Again, this shows you the kind of rough construction uh, and then this was a vacuum form piece that went on top there. It was always made as an access panel, but Kate, you did, even for this was a huge amount of work getting yeah, it to line up. It actually, um, there was quite a big gap where it fit in on the top. So I went through with some basically epoxy putty and kept building, building, building until I could get that line as clean as I wanted it. And then luckily there's these uh, wires that go over the top that help hide the seam even more. They help uh, hide the crimes as it were. Yes. Um, there's one aspect that is not quite complete. Some of these signs blink, um, and Mel uh, is still working on the blinking okay. circuit. Um, but it, it just, I, at some point, I bet your brain was just like, ah, I can't yeah. even hold it all in my head. Well, especially when it came to the wiring and electronics. It's, it's not my strong suit, and I forced myself through it. Uh, luckily, we had a lot of help from our great shop assistant, Mel, uh, but there was, you know, a time where I had all the lights wired and everything failed. <laughs> and the wiring was bad, and so I had to, I got to a point where I said, all right, rip it out, start over, and that was heartbreaking. There was at least a couple of, at least two whole weeks were just backtracking. Oh yeah, definitely, where I was like, no, I can fix it, I can fix it, and it was just like, no. The, the wiring wasn't coded properly, there were shorts everywhere, the board was giving us problems, so it just turned out to be, best step forward is to rip it out and start over. Um, I particularly love the fact that there are like six different colors of lights here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, gondola, in the gondola yeah. that they supposedly steer this blimp from. Um, the, like that must have bent your head a little bit. Actually, it was insanely hard to get them mounted in there as well because the only access point I had was a small hole in the top. So I was having to get down and over and try to like adhere the lights on the inside. So nobody sneezed around it. <laughs> also remember, this is one half the size of the one they built for the film. So all the bulbs are smaller, yes. all the fiber optics are smaller. Um, one of my favorite things is the fiber optics. There's hundreds and hundreds of feet of fibers running through this thing, all of them terminating at this little tiny DC gear motor with a, uh, uh, we'll show you, you'll be able to see close-ups of this when we open up the inside. Um, that's the rattling that you're hearing is that motor clamped into a Delrin housing and then this <laughs> wheel spinning allowing these colors to change. That's precisely how the original worked and I wanted that same kind of so that same kind of look to Definitely. it. Definitely. Well, and one of the things you, you gave Mel and I was an example of a color wheel from an R2-D2 unit. Yes, my original R2-D2. And that yeah. was what we studied and go, okay, well, how do we make this work? Because, of course, Mel and I are like, well, maybe we could just put some LEDs in there. And you're like, no, fiber <laughs> with a color wheel. And I'm glad we did because it feels so much more authentic. Yeah, yeah, it really matches the original look. Um, it's It's... So one of the things I love about a project like this is I've seen Blade Runner dozens of times. I've seen that blimp hundreds of times. I already had a folder of photos because I wanted to replicate it someday. But it was always this device of such complexity that it was just like noise, visual noise. But now, every part of this is in my head. Right? Right, like the whole thing, and you too. Oh, definitely, I'm never gonna forget like all of these ads. It was funny, there's actually um, a, a, an ad on here for the band Yes, and I was out the other night and there was a guy standing there talking to me and I was just staring at his shirt <laughs> and he's like, what, what's up? And I was like, oh, I have like, you know, this size <laughs> ad of that same Yes logo on my blimp and I'm just, that's all I can think about now. <laughs> Um, it is such a magnificent achievement. One of the last things I asked you to add was some bird shit. 
Yes. I thought there would be bird crap on this thing, and I had just bought some micro brushes, and you made some beautiful little guano spots. They were the on this. perfect teeny tiny brushes. I found the smallest brush that was in there, and I just added some great splats. You should have seen my phone as I'm just googling bird poop, and then like, <laughs> yeah, this is the shape it would be, right? Yeah. And then having to go through, actually, so my favorite process was a combination of the ads and the aging. Just, yeah. I think, I think distressing might be something that I, I love too much. Well, it's the, it's the part in which all of the disparate pieces get joined together. Yeah. I mean, one, like when you make a model and you prime it, as we've seen on Tested, it's really lovely to watch all that disparate detail become monochromatic. But even more, when you've done all this with the antenna, and then you start to make the rust streaks, and you start to do the, I notice there are bright and dark spots on some of these antennae, and it really helps sell the scale. And as I like bring my head up, I'm like, the scale doesn't, disappear no matter how close you get to it. Which is perfect. The worst thing in the world is to have somebody examine it closer and go, oh, you, well, you've blown scale here. Well, and the thing is, is that this is a far tighter scale than you would do if you were doing this for a film. Exactly. And when you look at film models up close, often you're like, wow, those are crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because this is a display model for, for people to stand here and look at, not for camera, there are aspects that, of the subtlety that might disappear on camera but are so perfect exactly just for seeing. That's exactly what I hope for. <laughs> you have done such an amazing job with this. I My hat is off to you and my great mad respect for this and uh, I'm just trying to think about what my wife will say when I put this on the bedside table. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to hate me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think it'll go in the office. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we will put up some, a gallery of close-up pictures of this because Norm cannot wait to get his camera out for this baby.